everybody. I have to admit that's pretty intimidating to, to hear the, uh, the national reach of here. I tend to do a few shout outs. I'm not too far from Lee County. I uh, went to University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Abingdon's 10 miles from where I grew up. I was born in North Carolina. I went to school in Connecticut. But that would be wrong. <laughs> uh, to do those things and uh, because it would be shamelessly pandering to all of you who I so much want to like me. Uh, because reading over this anthology is in its bound form the last few days when it's too late to change anything, I had flashbacks actually. I, I suddenly recalled being surrounded by huge stacks of novels that I was supposed to try to read through and it's a lot like how one chocolate is really good, but if they make you eat a whole box of chocolates, how it might seem a little too rich. Well, it, it felt kind of like that for a month or so when it was like, okay, let's, let's read another novel and see how that goes, and, but we can only just choose one. I, I recall piles of Xeroxes and rows of PDFs on my computer screen. Diary is to, in, is to confront the individual complexity of that in short stories and speeches and letters and memoirs and orders. And I know that it still looks like a lot in the book, you can just imagine how many didn't make it in the book, and, and uh, they're pretty intricately placed and related, um, and th so there's probably four or five things that we considered for everything that made it into the book. So trying to wrap your mind all around that led to the flashback, as did visions of stacks of history books, uh, many written by people I know uh, that I was not choosing. And uh, how in the world are we supposed to choose from the thousands of books that have been written about the American Civil War in ever-increasing numbers, 50,000 books about the Civil War since the Civil War itself, which is one a week if you do, do the math. So I re suddenly recalled how I would wake up in the middle of the night with ideas how to do all this and write it down, and I'm sure you know the feeling when you saw it in the morning, it wasn't quite that brilliant. And, uh, <laughs> Or I remember all the emails and phone calls with Lanny and Patty in which I, I promised that I would come up with something really soon uh, that, that would make sense of all this. And I want to thank them for their remarkable patience because I think it's fair to say that we made this as hard as we could. Um, <laughs> and uh, the people who work with me know that that is a trait of things that I'll, hey, let's don't just five, choose five books. Let's make one and let's do it in electronic form too. And let's track down, let's make as many primary sources as possible whose origins will be hard to find, things like that, and, it was, it, and they roasted. I kept thinking, let's see if they can do this, and they always did, and so we're here today. And I promised that we would expose people to new and sometimes unsettling perspectives on a topic that they either thought they knew really, really well and didn't really need to know anything else on and didn't really want to have their knowledge challenged, or a topic they did not think could possibly be interesting to them or to anyone else, and if it was, it shouldn't be. Uh, and so, that, uh, as somebody talks about the Civil War a lot, I know that, that that's sort of the two poles. There's a lot of people in the middle, and we're trying to bring in people across the entire spectrum. Now, all these challenges came back to me as I thought about joining you today, and after all, I'm now dragging innocent people uh, into this enterprise of uh, these primary sources and this uh, different kinds of genres from one week to the next. So you'll establish a pattern and then come change it the very next week. Now I admit these anxieties to you in all honesty to, to win your sympathy. Um, I want you to feel, if not my pain, my desire to live up to this remarkable opportunity that the NEH and the ALA have provided. You know, you don't find this opportunity very often, a chance to work with librarians, to work with scholars, to people who are hungry to know more in ways that you really can't get anywhere else. Uh, so all kidding aside, I, I felt it as a remarkable responsibility not to, to mess this up. So can we mix the familiar and the unfamiliar, the entertaining and the challenging, the comforting and the disturbing? Now the proportions of the mix are tricky. How much do we give people from the time itself where they talked differently uh, and where they went on a little bit too long and made classical references we don't get today? They're so thoughtless in that regard. Uh, and how much fiction and how much history? What, what's the right map mix? You know, because we know that um, a lot of people would much prefer to read novels, and a lot of people would much prefer to read a history book. Not many people are demanding to read primary documents, and so we have to kind of create our own constituency for that. How much military history and how much social and political? 
How much early, middle, and late in the war? Uh, we've already heard territorial battles being fought here, too, you know, on different sides of different borders. How much Union, how much Confederate, how much young and old, male and female, officer and enlisted, hero and deserter, east and west? All those things may not show, but those are all things that we had to consider and that you'll have to be aware of as you think about the discussions we're going to be having. And when we think about it that way, we can either give up, but I take it they've now brought us here, so it's too late for that, or we can decide that all those choices simply remind us of how wonderfully rich this topic is. And it's as rich as human nature itself and as contradictory as American history itself. Really, in this microcosm, we can see a lot of what this country is about being played out. Now, I must admit that I have an agenda with this strategy, which is to engage Americans more deeply than we usually do with our past. In all honesty, we like to skip across the top of our history. We like to read biographies of successful leaders and events that came out pretty well. Uh, we like to congratulate ourselves, or on the flip side, we like to excoriate ourselves for falling from some grace that we had at some point in the past. Often it seems like we began declining as soon as we were created. The founding fathers, awesome, immediately didn't live up to it, or the founding fathers deeply flawed and we never had a chance, or we're never going to have anybody else as good as Abraham Lincoln around, or boy, what a hypocrite. Or, uh, you know, boy, I just wish we had the days back of FDR, or thank goodness we had Ronald Reagan uh, freeing us from that. But in all those ways, we go back and think about how could, the history, how could American history be useful to me right now, rather than going into it with some humility and thinking, what does it actually say? And what does it say from there to me, rather than me just going back and choosing the parts that I like? I would suggest that history is most useful when we confront it with as much complexity and fullness as we can wrap our minds around. That we do our best not to tame it too quickly. And the Civil War has been domesticated. You felt the sit, it does come, it does, because we really packaged and, and contained it in such ways that it doesn't really bother us too much anymore. Even though you might think, boy, fortunately it ended in the greatest things that ever happened in this country, but it didn't begin to do that. That's the fundamental paradox in all of this, is that we'd like reading it backwards. Well, it ended at the unification of the United States and the ending of slavery. That must have been kind of in the cards all along. But I think you can see just the things we're gonna be talking about tomorrow in that first reading, it's not the cards at all. And even somebody as prescient as Frederick Douglass didn't see it in despair of what was coming. So embracing the complexity of the past also means embracing the complexity, the full humanity of each person. Now this, this will sound obvious to all the humanists and to all us librarians, but that's not always been the case. In many ways, the Civil War has fought the three broad categories of people. And of course, people who figure prominently in these readings, African Americans, were completely read out of the story for a very long time by dominant scholars. Um, and it, it wasn't that long ago that women had really only a small role to play in all of this. And it's still find the case that people uh, have a hard time imagining the full depth of what was the Union side really fighting for. My good friend Gary Gallagher pointed out there's not really a portrayal in American film or fiction of an entirely attractive Union military story. A lot of the Confederate side, but where are the heroes? We, we, so we lack the capacity even to imagine what's best about this story. And ironically, maybe in a human nature, we sympathize with the underdogs and the losers. So the most popular American movie adjusted for population, Gone with the Wind, uh, there's not really any powerful human stories in that. So the, the things we bring to the story, uh, we don't necessarily have all the pieces we need to tell a fully human portrayal of all the people involved. That's something that we, I think that we get a chance to do maybe for the first time in the country. And in many ways, that's the purpose of all these readings. In various ways, they permit us inside the experience of people who are living through remarkable circumstances to imagine ourselves in the profoundly human experience of war and striving and uncertainty and loyalty and hope and regret. The entire enterprise is 
the humanities. To imagine ourselves being another human so that we can understand ourselves better and maybe be a better humans going forward. Now, if we start with these experiences and work our way into other experiences, the history will unfold around them. I, I recognize that not everybody here is a historian. Uh, some of you luck out. Uh, but time matters. People had different perceptions in 1852 than they did in 1862. In 1885, then in 1865. In 2005, then in 1905. So one of the things we're going to have to do is constantly place these things in the flow of time as we place ourselves in the flow of time. Now I've tried to uh, arrange these things so that you don't have to memorize all the scaffolding of all the sequence of which battle came first and you know exactly who ran for the election of 1860 and things like that. I'm hoping that the pieces are compelling and self-contained enough that you can see what the story inside them is. What's the struggle this person had? Now, I would like to think that thinking about this for 30 years, I could read the Thoreau thing and have some idea of kind of some of the resonances that somebody who hasn't thought about it for 30 years might have. On the other hand, anybody should be able to feel the rage in that piece. And what's he talking about? Everybody knows who John Brown was. So what's he doing defending him? Or why should the deer question that he should need to be defended? So I don't see a need for elaborate background talks about all these things because the, the point is to, in, is to confront the individual complexity of that person in that moment.